Welcome to the Big Time Strength Podcast, featuring small school strength coaches making the big time where they're at. I am your host, Gage Rozier. Today's episode is sponsored by Team Builder. Team Builder provides strength conditioning software to athletics programs around the country. Whether you write your own programs or want access to over 100 templates, Team Builder can make your program more efficient, more accountable, and smarter when it comes to measuring your team's effort in the weight room. Visit their website and start a 14-day free trial at teambuilder.com. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Hey guys, this week I'm really excited to bring to you Coach Michael Silbernagel, head strength coach at University of Mary, a Division II school in Bismarck, North Dakota. Coach has been at the University of Mary since 2011, and he was recently named a master strength coach by the CSCCA in 2017. In this episode, we discuss his department's mission statement and culture, how he fundraises, how he manages his staff, some thoughts on the future of strength conditioning that I thought was very interesting, and how he structures his in-season training. A lot of great stuff here from Coach, and I know you'll take a lot from it. Now before we get to the episode, uh, a few notes I wanted to mention is, as you heard in the intro, Team Builder has decided to come on and officially sponsor the Big Time Strength Podcast. So I want to say thank you for them, and just elaborating that they do an amazing job. We love their product here at William Jewell College. And the customer service is great as well. So if you have questions on Team Builder or interested in looking into it, please visit their website at teambuilder.com. Again, really excited that they're coming on to sponsor the show. Also, I'd like to thank Coach Preston Peterson. We have a new website called bigtimestrength.com where you can find all the episodes and the show notes. um, And we'll, we'll eventually start pushing out some other information through that as well. So they'll be linked up in the notes. But bigtimestrength.com, Coach Preston did an amazing job on it. He did all the work on it, and I really appreciate him him doing that. And with that, I'd like to congratulate Coach Preston Peterson and his wife, Emily, for, for welcoming their new baby boy into the world, Jace Mitchell, uh, last week. So I might reach out to Coach and tell him congrats. He's got a, a new baby boy on his hands. That's It's pretty amazing. So, All right, having said that, let's get to this week's episode. I know you're going to enjoy it. Coach Michael Silbernagel. Hey, Coach Silbernagel, I really appreciate you, appreciate you coming on the Big Time Strength Podcast with us. Uh, why don't you get us started by just talking a little bit about your background through strength conditioning and where you're at right now? Yeah, uh, first off, thanks for having me. Uh, it's an honor to to be chatting with you this morning. Um, my background is I'm a, a small town North Dakota kid. Um, actually, played nine man football and and had uh, 27 kids in my class. So the the goal of being a strength coach was kind of a, a lofty one because I don't think anybody knew what it was in my town. They pro- probably still don't know what it is. But uh, became a graduate assistant at the University of North Dakota uh, in the fall of 03 and was there until uh, December of 04. Became an assistant strength coach at Colorado State University uh, in January of 05 and worked with many different teams down there from 05 until December of 2010. And I've been the head strength coach at the University of Mary since January of 2011. Well, that's a lot of great experience. And and over that time, I'm sure you've been able to really narrow down on what you believe in as far as core values and what your goal is. So let's talk a little bit about what your mission statement is and and core values for your program. You know, I think a a little bit and taking it from – uh, what we've seen, uh, Ken Manny, I think at Michigan State, the first person I saw this statement from is, "We will not accept you as who you are, but we'll show you what we can, what you can become, and help you to achieve it." And uh, kind of going with that "iron sharpens iron" uh, quote afterwards is kind of something we've piggybacked off of. Um, anytime our athletes come into our weight room, we want them to improve something. Um, the way we've kind of spun it is, you know. To me, the weight room is the athletic department hardware store. And it, I love my sisters, but they can go shopping for three hours and come back with nothing and say they had a great time. Whereas if you stand outside of a hardware store, and I don't care what you know brand name, local, uh, big box it is, people are always going in and coming out with a purpose. And that's what we try to communicate to our coaches and our athletes here, that I don't care what day it is, you're going to come into the weight room with a purpose and you're going to leave with some kind of result, no matter how big or how small that is. Uh, it's never just coming in to look around. Oh, I love that. I love that analogy. I'm going to start using that. How about 
what's your culture of your program? So when people see your athletes in there, what are they going to take away of just the culture, the vibe of what you got going on? Well, hopefully they're going to be able to see a group of athletes, no matter what the sport that's there to work. Um, everything that we do, I mean, we have a, a weight room that's about 3,500 square feet and we've got to stick a lot of athletes into that space. So everything is basically freedom within structure. And we're going to have a structure laid out to where everything is on a whistle when we start sets, et cetera, and we time our rest intervals. But they're going to have the freedom in between those sets to, to talk about movies or talk about life or, or whatever else. But as soon as that whistle is to start the next set, they know it's work time. And try to balance that to where it's not super serious when it's in there. You know, but when you do walk in, you're going to see, man, there's a flow, there's a structure, there's work being done, and there's a level at which it's going to be accomplished. Our athletes are our assistant coaches. Our upperclassmen are the ones who are going to help keep that standard there. Um, you'll hear them helping each other out. You know, our motto is kind of when you're up, you worry about you. When you're not, you worry about a teammate. So they're helping to reinforce, hey, where should our feet be on a squat? Where should we be looking? Um, they're going to count their teammates' reps so that when their teammates doing the work, they're concentrating on the technique that's been taught to them up until that point. How long did it take – for your athletes to get to that point? Because I, I feel like my first few years here at, here at Jewel, I, I struggled with that. I wanted that. I feel like we are finally starting to get there. Is that You think that's a process, or is that just something that <laughs> can pick up pretty quick? Um, well, I think when I first got here, I thought it was something you could pick up pretty quick. Yeah. And then after my first you know day on the job, I was going, what was I thinking? Um, but it is a process. I'd say it probably took five years until it got to where I wanted it to be. And what we've done now is we've, we've added to it. So we live in a day where everyone has instantaneous feedback, right? If you want something, you Google it. Uh, what we did is we gave what we could do for instantaneous feedback is we grade our athletes every day. Okay. So we have a set of standards in the room. It has nothing to do with how much weight's on the bar, or how fast you are. It's if you're a green, you did something that's above our standard. Right? And above our standard, really only four things. And it's uh, being aggressive on an open set and not failing. It's bringing positive energy to the room during the duration of the workout. Being an assistant coach uh, to your teammate. Um, and I'll be honest, I don't have it in front of me. I can't remember number four. But our, our yellow is you met the standard. And that's just showing up on time, wearing appropriate apparel, doing the reps and sets as prescribed nothing really mind boggling in terms of, of what the standard is. And then below the standard is a red and that's skipping reps, failing on a set where we told you, you know, not to fail on talking back to a coach, not communicating with the training room in the proper way. So we, we tie our sports medicine staff into what our communication channels are uh, missing a workout for any reason. And there's really no gray area and the numbers are there. Everything's posted. So if you're a yellow, we don't have to put anything in that box. You just, you know, it says Mike Sobernago yellow for 425. If you are a green or a red, we have the items listed numerically, and we just put that number in the box. So we'll highlight that color. Uh, green, you were a green two today, or you are a red 13. And uh, really, it's easy to look for because all you have to do is look for the outliers when you're coaching. Yeah, so that's just on there. So you don't really have to look for a, a yellow. You're looking for a red or a green as the workout goes on. Gotcha. And then we just take notes as we're, as we're coaching it. And gotcha. that's been really big, too. They don't have to like what the standards are, right? But they're aware of them because it always seems like when you bring a group up and you're talking and you're mad at someone for doing something wrong and you address the whole group with it, the one who did something wrong is like, yep, not me. And the kid who's busted their tail the whole time is going, man, I don't know what I did. Right. And this allowed that to clean it up. That's a really unique way you're doing it there. That's awesome. I'm going to, I might have to pick your brain a little bit more on that. Cause I think that's a valuable tool that we could use here at, at Jewel as well. Um, let's talk about some other unique things you're doing. What are some unique ways you're making the big time where you're at? You know, I think number one is you hear a lot, you have to make it your brand. Uh, when we came here, they had a big sign on the wall that said Marauder strength. And, uh, but yet everyone was wearing apparel from different universities. So the first thing we did is we got rid of different university apparel. 
because we, we talked to athletes about being, you know, a walking billboard for someone else. So then we started creating different, you know, T-shirts that, that we had with our brand that only student athletes could take part in. And I know a lot of other schools do that. But over the time, it's grown. So now we have 100 shirts that we order every fall. And it's like a special edition shirt for that year. And this year, we sold 60 shirts in the first two days. Wow. So there's only 40 left. I mean, I've got former athletes trying to get it. We've created that uh, buzz because as soon as a shirt's bought in and we get the money from it, we put something right back into the weight room. So they also can't wait to see what new thing we're going to get, whether that's new foam rollers or new bands. Or I remember the one year we bought Airx pads and we did negative glute ham raises. They weren't kneeling on the floor. And you would have thought that we had just won the Super Bowl in terms of the excitement um, from something like that. <laughs> But now we do everything from coffee mugs to bucket hats to trucker hats, and it's kind of created itself as something that these kids want to take part in because they realize that they had to sacrifice in order to be able to purchase something like that. And the money goes right back into what they do. Um, the other way we've done it is we've tried to set the system up to look like what the big-time schools have. I, I was fortunate. I was out of Division One for six years, and we've brought that mentality into our room in terms of what our workout sheets are like, how everything's organized, how we're going to communicate with our coaching staff, um, what we're going to ask of our student athletes, um, but then do things that are, are free, such as social media, uh, Instagram, Twitter, things of that, and put information out there because that's how the kids utilize it nowadays. And they like seeing themselves. And, and I got some grief because I even started our Insta story this year and, and, and now they're loving it. And I, personally can't stand it because it takes time away from what we're doing but but they like it and then that creates a, a positive buzz as well yeah we were talking a little bit before we started recording about your social media and your stuff you use as far as all right this is good choices in the calf today or cafeteria or whatever else it might be uh i really enjoy your your instagram and your twitter account so i encourage our listeners to check those out so you're getting funding, maybe a little bit additional funding from that T-shirts. Are there any other ways you've gone about fundraising for your department? Um, you know, when we started, it started off as we had a lot of random equipment in our room. And I was very fortunate, uh, had an athletic director who basically let me do what I wanted to do. Um, I was like, hey, can we sell some of this old equipment and buy things that are more efficient for us? Uh, an example would be we had two sets of dumbbells and we had a lot of kids who were just waiting and standing, waiting for their dumbbell. And we said, hey, can we sell these to a high school and go with a power block route? And it started off to where we sold, you know, two sets, about six sets of power blocks, uh, boosters, I thought that was an awesome idea. Now all of a sudden the boosters were willing to buy the other set. Um, we pick and choose when we go to the boosters. So not every year do I submit something because I want them to be able to spread it out to other sports so that when we do go, they're more likely to go, you know what, we haven't helped them out in a couple of years. We're going to, and, and that's been fantastic. Um, the first couple summers, we ran high school camps, and the money, instead of going into our pockets, went into creating that budget. And now our, our sport coaches have become our biggest advocate, and that's even not only how I've grown the budget a little bit, but grown our staff size. Our coaches have gone in, you know, after my first few years, and like, hey, we need to get some more help in the weight room. What can we do? And uh, that's been the biggest proponent is when the, the coaching staff is on your side. Yeah, that's amazing that they're they're able to use some of their money to help you with the staff. So let's talk about staffing. How do you, how do you manage and develop and evaluate your staff? Well, we kind of went to a, a different way of evaluation. Um, number one, every one of our sport coaches gets to evaluate our staff in general, but they don't get to evaluate us in terms of reps and sets and exercises. They get to evaluate us in terms of our communication was everything thorough how do we fit into their team? When we had a meeting, did we come to a conclusion to help get the results that they're looking for? Um, is there any other additional resources that they have that we think could be beneficial to our staff? Because they go to clinics and conferences as well, and um, we want to make sure that we're all on the same page. And then this last year, I actually created a uh, red, yellow, green standard for every person on our staff. Like these are our Marauder Strength and Conditioning 
green expectations for coaching, our yellow expectations for coaching, our red expectations for coaching. Um, the next category we did was for uh, continuing education. You know, and that was kind of a self eval from theirs and what we to expect them to grow on their self. The other one was their communication with their coaches and administration. And the last one was the extra assigned duties, which might be uh, ordering our chocolate milk or dealing with the fundraising side of things or uh, even getting our, our peanut butter and jelly station ready. So now we've got kind of a, a multi-headed evaluation process where we can give them feedback from the coaches. We can give them feedback uh, from myself and they get to grade themselves as well to see what areas we can continue to improve upon. How often do you do that evaluation every semester, once a year or? So with our sport coaches, it's once a year uh, with uh, myself, we do it every semester, especially since a lot of the coaches that we have on our staff are, are young coaches, GAs, like, you know, I used to be, and you used to be, the more feedback you can get without it being overwhelming, but being simple is good feedback. And really every day is an evaluation tool. If we see something that needs to be addressed, we don't wait until, hey, you know, the December evaluation period. We're going to talk about it right now and move forward from it. Yeah, that's great. That's something. I just got a GA. Well, been a little bit over a year now, but trying to get um, a good system to where he's getting evaluated and he evaluates me and to make sure that us and his staff are growing is something I'm always trying to look into. So I think the red, yellow, green concept, bringing it to your coaches as well is a great great way to to just continue that evaluation across the whole department. And then I guess, you know, the other part of your question, you talked about developing them. You know, we got to be honest with people. And sometimes honesty isn't what you want to hear, but what you need to hear. And then just like our, our motto went back, that mission at the beginning is show you what they can become and help them to achieve it. Give them books to read. Give them videos to watch. Give them podcasts to listen to to help them grow. You know, it has to be an intrinsic drive, but at the same time, we need to be able as, as mentors to point these kids in the right direction to be successful. There's too much information out there not to. Yeah, absolutely. How about one of the toughest hurdles you've had to face? What are some of those challenges you've had and how have you overcome them? Oh, man, I think the toughest hurdle was when I first got here and no one knew what they were doing. You know, because you, we all think that, after you've been coaching a while, well, this is every, everyone should understand how to read a sheet, right? Everyone under, should understand how to load the bar or this and that. And those were actually some of the toughest ones was to get, to, you know, a sport coach to uh, hear the sport coaches had done their own strength and conditioning before I got here. So now they felt like they were losing part of the team by having an outsider come in and be their strength coach. Even though I'm an extension of their staff, uh, it was something that was a little bit hard. So what we did is we invited those coaches into the room and let them watch whenever they wanted to. And I had a football coach who was in there every day for six weeks, didn't matter the lifting time. And then he saw how everything was working, and then he'd pop in basically once every six weeks from that point on. But right away it was one of those things of, of building that trust and that relationship, showing that it's not you taking anything away, but you adding to their program. Yeah, bringing them in and having them watch that workout. I think I still suck. I think some coaches still struggle with me at, at Jewel, kind of in the same situation we've had. Um, some coaches have been there for 15 years and they've only had a full time strength coach for the past five. So still trying to learn, um, you know, how they can use us and that we're not trying to take stuff away, but just add to their program. Um, I think that's really good. Getting that buy in from coaches that you're doing there is awesome. Let's uh, talk about the future of strength conditioning. That's something you kind of wanted to maybe chime in on. And there's been a lot of talk recently in the, in the news and stuff about strength conditioning. So let's talk a little bit about that. You know, I think after being in it for a while, we have to go back to where it all started and, and understand that the best interest of the athlete has to be our priority. And it's hard because we deal with – Sport coaches, as I just mentioned, and you just mentioned, right? The the coaches that that uh, don't want to give up um, some of that power or part of the team that they've been with, and how do we communicate with them? And 
I think that starts off as number one. We've really got to find a way to help be the one that educates everybody and not just a bobblehead. And I know I'm probably stirring the pot a little bit with that statement and I'm not trying to, but I'm, I'm also trying to be honest um, to where we bring the knowledge to the table. You know, I've, we've heard the statement before of act like the dumbest person in the room. And, and I like to throw an asterisk next to that is, is when you are. You know, if I'm talking to our head track coach and he's the speed guy, I'm going to keep my mouth shut and take as many notes as I can on speed development and see how I can get better. But when they start talking about how we do things in the weight room, I also want to make sure that I'm bringing my expertise to the table and that it's a multifaceted approach. Finding coaches who are confident enough to do that, I think, is what creates that bond and buy-in and also sets our athletes up for success. The ability to have professionalism in our field is one that's becoming more and more challenging because at times, you know, you, on social media, we become the easy target to show energy, right? We're the big and fired up with the strong. And sometimes that can get portrayed wrong, especially like I said, my hometown still doesn't know what I do. So if I put something out there on social media of, of me doing something that I don't want to be a reflection of my profession, that's not what they think we do. Right. And, uh, if we can find those ways, I think that's going to be huge. And then continue to improve the education and oversight, which I don't think anybody has the answer on the oversight piece. Um, Cause there's so many different ways to do our job, but I think continuing to push those limits, uh, Kurt Hester has, has brought some great things to the forefront, Bob Alejo uh, amongst others to keep moving this thing forward and not getting to where we're going backwards. Yeah, absolutely. And with that oversight, if, if you don't mind, how are you um, evaluated from administration there? So what they did is, and this is actually the, the first year we've done it this way, is they have a list of my job duties and they gave me a percentage breakdown of what each of my duties are. So it totaled 100%. And as you know, there's a lot of things we do. So some things are 10% and 5% and and 3% and et cetera. Um, and a few things are higher, but at the end of the year, when I meet with our athletic director, cause that's who I report to, we, we do a breakdown of all those areas. And, uh, that's kind of how I'm evaluated right now. Um, and we'll see how that continues to evolve moving forward. Gotcha. Well, at least it's clear and you kind of know what the, what they're expecting out of you. That's, I think that's a lot more than a lot of coaches can say in their position. So. Yeah, it's definitely been a step in the right direction um, in terms of that process, for sure. Good deal. Well, let's get into a little bit of training. Um, what's your training philosophy? You know what? I, I was I kind of smirked when I saw it. We've, I've gotten rid of the term philosophy. Okay. Uh, I think philosophies are where are kind of like politics and, and religion. You only fight over them. <laughs> no one ever really comes to a true understanding. If you have a disagreement, you just kind of nod and walk away. Sure. So the term we like to use is principles. We're a principle-based program now because uh, I got into a couple really good, we'll just say strong disagreements with coaches and realized none of us were getting what we wanted out of it. So that's why we changed the, the way we communicate. So we're a, we're a ground-based program. We don't have a lot of machines, if any, really in our facility, but we're going to do a type of triple extension. Now, for some sports, that might be Olympic movements, for other sports, that might be different jumps and throws or a combination of both. Uh, it doesn't mean that everybody snatches or tests on power cleans. We train lower body bilaterally and isolaterally, upper body the same way, isolaterally and bilaterally. We're going to push and pull. I keep training that post to chain. We're basically looking at a balanced approach to training in the weight room. And at the division I'm at, with the kids we're getting, we're also looking at how do we increase efficiency and movement, not just, well, this is a speed day and this is a plyo day and this is a, a change of direction day, but looking at a holistic approach is how do we become more efficient runners? How do we improve our arm swing and our stride length and our recovery? Can we do everything in multi-planes, front to back, side to side, uh, and increase the durability of the athlete from that standpoint? So I hope I'm answering your question well enough with – we're still leaving some some open areas for discussion. No, absolutely. I love I love all that. We try to do 
very similar concepts with how we're we're programming here at, at Jewel, and I, I just I'm with you on all those. So, how about in season training? Everybody's kind of transitioning, you know, with football. A lot of us are in that football role. Obviously, we're in that in season time now. So, what's your views on in season training? Yeah, I like the, a lot of hot topic, right? You're either you're either getting stronger in season or you're maintaining in season, depending on who you want to talk to. And and us, we do a little bit of both. Um, but we're going to look at weak point training in season. So my my powerlifting background is, you know, how do you improve your weak points to get stronger overall? Well, I don't have to bench press at 90% in season to get stronger at bench press. I can do lockout work. I can do isolateral work, depending upon what those kids are doing while still saving their joints for the game. Um, Same thing with squat. Right now, our our bigs, for example, our our O-linemen, D-linemen, guys that are in that squat position a lot uh, or bend position uh, on the field, we're going to squat with, with chains. So we deload that bottom position, but we're still going to get a heavier load from that halfway point up to still tap into that recruitment firing pattern uh, that we want to. How can we use complexes in it, um, et cetera, in, in terms of the Olympic movements to still keep some kind of speed development going, but also touch on that work capacity piece. And then we're always going to start bilaterally with us, the furthest away from game day. And that's going to be a primarily bilateral emphasis. And we're going to go to an isolateral emphasis for the workout that gets closer to the, to the game. It allows us to keep our intensities a little bit lower compared to our testing movements, but we can still push intensities on uh, some of the other movements that we do. So you might expand in a little bit on what that week looks like. So we play Saturday. Uh, what's kind of the breakdown of how that week looks um, going into next Saturday? Okay. So for us, um, we train on Sundays. Okay. So we'll actually have three different programs going on within our football program, if that's our example. Um, we'll have a bigs playing, a skills playing, which will lift Sunday and Wednesday. Sunday being a day of, of bilateral work, um, everyone starts off with a clean complex of a, a pull, high pull catch um, for the first four weeks. And I should kind of back it up. We break our season into four different phases, the first four weeks, the second four weeks, and the last three weeks. And that will allow us to see where we're playing home and away, uh, how our injury rate's going in terms of things and things. Lower body, your big guys are squatting with chains for the first four weeks. Our skills are not with chains, and they have a lighter load going a little bit more volume. Uh, you know, they might be doing five to six reps where our bigs are going a five, three, one type concept, so we're still pushing a little bit more weight just because of the demands of what they do on the field uh, for our system okay. and the type of offense and defense that our coach runs. Uh, skills are going to go to an incline bench uh, where we're working up to a, a pretty heavy five. Our bigs for the first four weeks are going to go to a shoulder saver bench press to where we're still sticking with that 5-3-1 concept. We'll both then do a a vertical pull, which is our chin-ups, and then we will finish off with an inverted roll for our skills paired with an iso dumbbell RDL. We'll go with an iso dumbbell roll for our bigs paired up with a regular RDL, and then we'll finish with some buys and tries and some neck work. Um, On our Wednesday, everything now becomes lighter in nature and, and bi- or isolateral, excuse me, for the most part, our bigs are going to be doing a hang clean into a front squat uh, for their Olympic movement, nice and light and fast. Our skills are going to be doing a split dumbbell push jerk. We're then going to go to step-ups for bigs, lunges for skills, uh, weighted push-ups for skills. Our bigs are going to do an iso-incline dumbbell bench, and we're going to do a, a vertical pulling, a horizontal pulling, some posterior chain, uh, we cut our volume down on our posterior chain, just a couple sets of three, a couple sets of five, um, and then buys and tries. Uh, the second group that we have there is, is after week three, we develop a in-season developmental group. So once we know who's kind of a, a special teamer, maybe getting five to ten reps a game, they're now going to go Sunday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, which is more of a developmental program compared to what the ones and twos are doing. Gotcha. Um, total body day Sunday, uh, lower body day on Wednesday, 
upper body day on Thursday. And then we have our developmental program who's not traveling. And that's just not freshmen. That's anybody who's not traveling in our program. They actually lift Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, um, to where we do a total body day on Tuesday. So they can still be really good at practice for their job on scouts. Uh, Thursday is an all upper body day. Once again, so they can still attack that scout workout. And then Friday uh, is when we get after it from a lower body standpoint, because they have no practice and they're not playing on Saturday. Awesome. I appreciate you sharing that. I always like to uh, kind of look how different coaches structure their stuff in season and it all makes sense. And um, I'm sure you guys are ready to roll on Saturday, which is obviously what's most important. So, all right. Yeah, kinda, that's the ultimate goal. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Our last topic a little bit, a little bit is uh, you do some interesting stuff with bands um, and with being in a limited staff, we talked a little bit how you're using bands to kind of help um, with those coaching cues and that type of stuff. So, you mind elaborating a little bit on that? Yeah, so, you know, we utilize our bands to help show an athlete what a bad feeling is. Okay. So if we're, we're doing a squat, for example, we'll hook up a mini band above their knees. Um, we'll have them have a, uh, for us, it's an orange band, but an, an average band strength around their hips, and a partner's going to be holding that. And then they'll have, hold a 10-pound plate. Uh, and try to squeeze it together um, as if they're they're crushing it, so to speak, um, with their elbows high. What we're trying to do there is get them to engage their lats, and by pulling that plate together, they're engaging their lats, and they can feel that before they put a bar in their front rack or back squat rack positioning. The band that's getting pulled at their hips is pulling them forward, and we're trying to teach them to reach their hips backwards. So now they get a feel there, and the band that's around their knees is allowing us to teach them and get them to feel what it's like to drive their knees apart during a squat rather than relaxing and letting that band pull them together. So that's one way that we will utilize bands from a teaching cue standpoint is to get them to, to learn how to feel things without us putting our hands on everybody. Um, same thing for a, a tuck and flare type mindset of bench press. We do a band press before we, we start benching so that they can feel what it's like to if they let loose, that band's going to just pull their arms back to their body rather than pulling it down and controlling that range of motion. Um, and then we'll use bands in a bunch of different ways because we don't have the machines in the setup. So we use them from everything from banded pull-downs as if it's a, a pull-down machine and use different tempos with it because obviously bands don't have weight adjustments. But when we're you know, going down fast, concentrically, holding an isometric hold at the bottom and then working an eccentric control for three to five seconds on the way back um whether that's a leg curl leg extension uh banded good morning uh buys and tries or banded lunges things of that nature we're going to try to utilize those to uh to help get our athletes a bunch of different things without maybe having the uh, sheer weight um beating them up yeah, are, so, are some of those exercises um, up you put on Twitter or Instagram that maybe coaches could go look at? Are any of those on there? Yeah, um, they're on Twitter, they're on Instagram. We also have uh, a YouTube page that has all of our movement, our shoulder mobility uh, information on there as well. Uh, all that stuff is accessible, or they can reach out to me and, and I can get that to them as well. Right on, that's awesome. All right, Coach, this has been awesome. Let's uh, wrap this up. And five quick questions to finish the day. Sound good? Sounds good. All right. Who is the greatest influence on your coaching career? Um, my college defensive line coach. Awesome. Uh, Greg Horner is his name. Okay. Favorite office snack? Uh, you know what? I'm going to go with I've got two little kids, so I'm actually just going with a fruit snack. There you go. Because <laughs> uh, they're always available. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. All right, favorite caffeine source? Espresso. Espresso, nice. All right, you got 15 minutes to train yourself. Uh, what are you doing? I'm going to do a Javoric complex. I'm going to back squat. I'm going to pair up some push-ups and some chin-ups, and I'm going to go push a prowler. Nice. I, I don't think I'd be pushing a prowler, but that's good. <laughs> that's good. That's good. All right, last one. Small school strength coach who's killing it deserves a shout out. Uh, I'm going with one of the the young men that I've uh, had the privilege of mentoring, and he's down at Morningside uh, College in Iowa. Is Aaron Jung? 
he's running a one man show down there by himself. He's doing a great job. Awesome. Okay, coach, this has been great. I really appreciate you coming on, especially, you know, at this time of year, everybody's ramping up and being busy and uh, appreciate you taking the time. I will link all of your contact info in our show notes. Um, so I appreciate um, you coming on. And if any coaches want to reach out to you, do they, is email, anything you prefer? What, whatever makes them comfortable. I, I can communicate any way they want me to. Awesome, coach. Again, I appreciate it. This was great. Uh, have a good fall. Good luck. Hey, thanks for having me on and good luck to yourself and everyone else out there.